what to get the Call the meeting to order. Rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So welcome to our uh, third of three budget workshops, Wednesday the 20th of January. Um, first order of business and public comment. Are there any members of the, oh, there's one member of the public I see. Is there any members of the public that wish to address the board? Member of the public. Okay, let me read the public comment notice. Speakers may offer objective comments about school operations and programs. The board encourages speakers not to express personal complaints or defamatory comments of the Board of Education personnel or any person associated with Milford Public Schools. Security issues and matters relating to negotiations and grievances will not be permitted. Consistent with the principles of the Federal Education Right to Privacy Act, discussion of students is prohibited absent parental waiver. Public comment is limited this evening to agenda items only. Please state your name and address for the record and confine your comments to three minutes. Sure. Well, sure. Um, Augie Harrigan, 107 Orn Oak Road. Um, want to uh, also welcome the new board members who are here. Um, just a short comment about the budget. Um, my initial overview of it, um, I feel like it's a really responsible budget obviously uh, holding a really small increase. I did notice that we do have some items in there um, that I think are supposed to help the Career Pathways program, and it appears to be some piloting for computer science and, and things that we're seeing um, emerge, certainly in other school systems, and I'm really happy to see that that's in there. I think that's really necessary. I think it's not just the job of magnets and other sort of more boutique programs to encourage this. I think it's important and vital to Milford um, I think it really shows uh, some dedication to STEM or even STEAM, and I really hope that we see that go through, and I hope that we see a commitment to that in the long-range planning side of things. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other members who wish to address, any members of the public who wish to address the board? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to um, agenda item three, final questions and clarifications of the superintendent's proposed budget. Dr. Beezer. Thank you. Um, good evening to all the board members. Uh, so we had two questions that have come in um, since a week ago um, when we were all updated as of last Friday and then a couple more questions came in. So the first one was a follow-up question regarding the generator and I'll ask Mr. Richitelli to please address that. Sure. Uh, outside of what the board has been provided with the, uh, the details of the exact dollar amounts and, and the percentages and things like that, um, since since last week, there was there was one thing that I wanted to bring the boards bring, bring to the attention of the board, and that is that the current generator that's at Jonathan Law is more than 20 years old, and so eventually uh, the the lifespan is 20 years for a generator, and we've kept good care of it. Um, but at some point within the next five to ten years, we're going to need to replace that generator at Jonathan Law anyway, and so. Um, it, 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 the the fact that the state has a, or the city has applied for a state grant and we can get this generator for sixty thousand dollars, that's an asset that we'll have at Jonathan Law that we won't have to replace in the next five to ten years. So I think just from a business decision, um, whether we're able to um, work out a deal with the city where we split the cost or not, um, I, I think that um, sixty thousand dollar sixty thousand dollars for a 200,000 plus generator uh, that we'll be able to use for the next 20 to 25 years is a good business decision to make. So that's that's the only information more that I have than you've already been provided. Are there any further questions on that? Yeah. I, yes, Mr. Jagodzinski. Yeah, I, I'm not going to propose that we change that in any way. I, I think, you know, uh, we should go ahead but I do have a problem with the mayor interjecting himself into the Board of Ed budgeting process or any of the other activities of the Board of Ed. Uh, we're a state board, we don't report to them. Uh, the city charter is set up in such a way that the mayor has no uh, control over the Board of Ed. And uh, I think that when any mayor interferes with the Board of Ed, uh, it's inappropriate. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Any other comments? Further questions on the generator? 
Um, I had one, just one clarification. The, we do st we store food at Jonathan Law, right? There's that big thing right. outside, whatever I can remember it's called, cold storage? Is yes. it a freezer? Whatever it's a walk -in, it is. It's a walk-in freezer. Uh, walk-in freezer. Okay, yeah. so the gen this generator keeps that running? It does. Correct? If A generator needs to keep that running if power goes out at Law, in the right. Law area? Yeah. And, okay. and primarily the generator that we have there now will keep that running and to a limited extent the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. that, that's the that's you know that's as, as strong it. as it is. This new generator will do much more. Okay. All right. Thank you mm -hmm. for the clarifications. Any other clarifications on that? Edith, this is um Federico. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. I may have missed this, but are we would we get rid of the old generator in this case? No, we place stay. it? It's it would, supplemental. It stay. Correct. Okay. Yep. When the old generator goes, we would decide if we need to buy another one. No, we won't. We we will not replace the old one. Oh, okay. This one will be more than capable of taking over what the old one was doing plus more. Okay. Yep. So I'm sorry. So is the old one coming out? No. Nope. Or it's going to stay until it until stay it until it goes. Use it okay. until it Thank dies. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <I'm sure. coughs> All right. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. DeGrego. Just a matter of. Uh, I'm not an electrician, but you know, sometimes when you buy a refrigerator and you say, geez, I saved so much on electricity from the last one, I should have done, got a new one 10 years ago. Is it more efficient? Uh, I mean, being that it's 20 years in time, well, it's, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't have specific knowledge that it is, but I have to assume that it is. Just, just like you're assuming <coughs> that, you know, it's better technology, I'm sure that it is more efficient than the old one is. Thanks, Mr. Richard. Sure. Thank you. Okay, is that it? Can we move on? All right. And the second question had to do with the um, pre-K to 12 social emotional curriculum. <laughs> Mr. Burt, do you want to speak to that? Sure, thank you. Um, rather than reread the answer here, um, I'm just going to go over the, the, the question itself and say, is, is there a five-year plan for a social emotional curriculum? Um, our timeline, we are always looking at revisions for curriculum. We, um, for all of our curriculum documents within the next year, we're going to get to a five-year cycle for all curricular areas. In other words, if social studies gets finalized next year, we'll then place it into a five-year plan. We'll plan on bringing any kind of revisions back uh, five years after it's um, uh, brought into effect. Uh, in this case, however, we're, we're looking at um, our current practices, our instructional practices, any protocols we might have. Um, and currently, we do have pockets of, of uh, a social emotional program throughout the schools at different levels, but we don't have a clearly articulated pre K through 12 program. The intent is, and the plan is over the next 18 months, to really do, uh, examine our current practices, look at local, state, and national research, and look at best practices, and then use our local resources to really implement something next year, starting next year, primarily starting with the elementary level and then working our way up, but it's not a five-year plan per se, it's really more compressed than that. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Um, the other part of the question, the additional staff, um, unlike say a social studies curriculum, you know, in a high school we have a, a U.S. history class that requires a teacher. Uh, the model we're looking to uh, incorporate for social emotional learning is really about including this as part of instruction in our current programs. For example, we have advisory program at the high schools, we have health classes, um, but we're also looking at um, just embedding good, sound social and emotional skills and instruction in our daily instruction for all of our teachers, as, you know, more specifically at the pre-K through five level because that is where we know developmentally a lot of things happen, but also at the middle school level. Um, so the bottom line is no, we don't need additional staff. Um, the final part of the question, are there other communities in Connecticut that have a social-emotional curriculum or components? Um, the answer is uh, vague, unfortunately, but really it's through my experiences, through Betty's experiences, my colleagues' experiences in other districts, um, and, and just speaking with our colleagues, we know that there's elements in every district in Connecticut. We know um, that there's a national focus now on this aspect of learning because all of the research and, and our anecdotal evidence just through our own experiences, we know that if kids are not ready to learn when they come in because of they're not ready to do school, you know, they're not ready emotionally to be in, in the classroom, um, they're not socially able to navigate our hallways or navigate our classrooms, that 
they have lower achievement, they have greater disciplinary issues and higher absenteeism rates. So this is becoming a national trend. Even our state legislature has been passing um, laws uh, recently to, for DCF in particular, to, be, to pay close attention to social emotional development. So we know this is an intrinsic part of our instruction. Our teachers are asking for this, our administrators are asking for this, so we know that this is crucial to our work over the next few months and few years. So board members, the answer on that we were giving goes onto the back page. It took me a couple of minutes to realize that, so just so that I'm sure that everybody is aware of that. Mr. Whiskeyman. Um, how, how does this program fit in with both regular and special education? Is it across the board? Is it focused on one area or, or another more than the other? Or is it intended to kind of incorporate everyone? It's, it's really, well, again, we try not to do a one-size-fits-all, but it's, it's going to address everyone. It's not a. It's not compartmentalized. It really, especially you know, as we talk in the younger ages, um, we want students to be developmentally appropriate for their age group. And there's, there's, we have identified skills for students to, to be able to act in a certain way and behave in a certain way and be able to deal with situations at different grade levels. You know, I, I was just you know, uh, thinking about how how that works, and I know that we have moved forward toward. Um, more participation of uh, special ed students in regular classrooms, trying to mainstream as many as possible. Um, I was just wondering how how this fits into that effort, or 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 uh, just works within that uh, framework that we we have already uh, kind of established or moving toward. So I would uh, like to add that um, focusing on the social emotional development both for students that are not identified and those that are identified requiring special ed services is going to be a benefit on both sides because it's going to help other students be much more willing to accept students who may be included and it's also going to continue to develop the skill level of those students identified requiring special ed services. Um, many of them lack the, the um, social skills that are necessary and that's been a focus that we've been doing with students. But it'll be great to have this as a um, complete curriculum where all staff are working with students. And I think it's going to be an advantage for everyone. Thank you. Other questions or comments on this issue? Mr. DeGrego? Thank you, Madam Chair, through you. Mr. Birch, thank you very much for that presentation. <clears throat> I'm just a little uh, um, in the dark about something. I just wanted to bring it to light. These children, um, when I taught uh, uh, special ed uh, inclusion now, I used to teach special ed by itself, then it became inclusion. Uh, the, the, some of these children have aides that are with them throughout the day, or are they by themselves? You know what I mean? You have an, uh, an adult para. with them? A para. Well, you, para. yeah, we, we call them paras. But are they a company? Some do. Yeah. Yeah, there are some students who um, require individual assistance based on their particular needs. Um, but most of our students that are included do not come with an individual parent to the classroom. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other questions, comments? I, I would just add that I think that we have to be careful not to assume that, the, well, that it's only special ed kids who would have social emotional um, issues. Um, or concerns, um, because that's just simply not the case. Um, you know, when we start to really look at, you know, what are the social skills that we want kids to have? I mean, they're 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 critical for for any child, and anyone who I'm not an expert in pre-K or early childhood, but anyone who is an expert in early childhood knows that that fundamentally, you know, one of the, one of the greatest things parents can do with respect to their children and. Be, um, before they come into school is to work with their children around social skills. Because when children come into school, whether it's in pre-K or they come into kindergarten, if they don't know how to get along with other kids, that, that's a huge obstacle then for their learning as well as other children's learning. You know, And, and we see that as kids move up through the grades, it, it starts to manifest itself in terms of conflict resolution and kids who, who, who don't know how, don't have the skill set of you know, how to resolve a conflict instead of hauling off and punching somebody or 
you know, or, 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 or mouthing off and, you know, and, and escalating a situation, um, you know, and, and, and these are skills that, that we want everyone to learn, and, and we have, we have children, regardless of whether they're special ed and regardless of their background or regardless of you know, you know, their, cult, their, their uh, culture, et cetera, who come into our schools and they don't have these skills. And this is part of what, what this curriculum is intended to do. And then there's the whole emotional side. Um, you know, and, and so this, again, it's not my area of expertise, but I can tell you in terms of at least some wisdom I think I've gained over the years, the pressures that are on kids today far, far, far exceed what the pressures were on myself and, and many generations after me. Um, um, that, uh, it's just, it's incredible what the pressure that kids are under. It's incredible the pressures parents are under in terms of raising children in comparison to 30 years ago. Um, and, and we are seeing that in manifest itself in schools. We are seeing kids who, who are struggling emotionally in ways that we would never conceive of for kids who are 10 years old, 12 years old, 16 years of age. It, it was the exception um, growing up. But it's, I don't want to say it's the norm, but it's, it's much more, um, common than one might perceive, and kids who are, uh, you know, the, the levels of depression, the you know, the kids who 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 may be thinking about hurting themselves, uh, uh, you know, it, that's very very real, and that we are seeing that in our schools, and every, there isn't a district that's not seeing that the rise of that in their schools, and again, this crosses over socioeconomic status and race and and ethnic group and and special ed, regular ed, and that's part of this whole piece too, of really, um, you know, helping kids to, to you know, what are, you know, if, if they're not able to um, come to grips themselves with whatever they're struggling with, uh, what are the avenues you can take to, to get support, to get help, et cetera. Um, so that's all part of this, this piece. And as, and as Mr. Bird said, we have pieces that are in place, and we have some great pieces. But we're recognizing more and more there's some pieces that are missing. And, and so it's really you know, solidifying you know, um, a curriculum to ensure as kids move up through the grades, they're constantly getting reinforced in some skills that will benefit them, quite frankly, into adulthood. So. Can I ask when, so when we speak of curriculum, you know, we think of, you know, the math worksheets or, you know, topics, English, that's not, this is a little different, is it not, where it's more, maybe it's activities that the kids will do, but isn't it more bringing all the staff up to speed and getting everybody on the same page and... It, it's really more about identifying skills mm -hmm. by grade level, by age group, by expectations, um, identifying standards, if you will, of um, and just looking at, at best practices across the state. It's it we're going to use the word curriculum um, just because we want to give it that sense of structure, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be a standalone curriculum. Um, similar to what I would say, you know, 21st century skills. We don't want that as a separate curriculum. Um, we really want those skills of how to be critical thinkers and how to integrate your your thinking into other th other people's thinking and collaboration. That shouldn't be, okay, I'm going to do social studies and I'm going to do 21st century skills curriculum. Well, it should be embedded into other curricular areas. This is the same way. But in order to give identity to it, we're going to have to name it, put it in black and white, identify it, and then say, okay, where are the areas that we can embed this into our current practices? And if there's not areas, then we have to think about how we do address those needs. Okay. Other comments or questions on this? Mr. Whiskeyman? Uh, just one final thought along with, as with all other <clears throat> efforts, um, you know, I come from the engineering side, so if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So, you know, uh, could you speak a few minutes about, if you don't already have uh, ideas about that, what you plan to do to make it measurable. The things that we're looking at right now in terms of analysis over the next five months, um, some of the <coughs> more quantitative data would be attendance rates, disciplinary rates, referrals to behaviorist referrals to social workers, those type of things. That would be some, what we would hope are some real specific data 
that are, are available to us that we could analyze to say, are we seeing a reduction overall? We also have to do the qualitative data as well, get a sense from principals, what's the climate of your school, or from teachers, what's the climate like within your classroom? And, and basically say, after introducing some of these skills, are we seeing some of the quantitative changes? And then obviously we want to do a survey of teachers and staff and say, are we seeing the qualitative changes to the climate of your school? All right. Good. Any other questions? Comments? Okay, did anybody have any last questions that they wanted to ask at this point? No question, just comments. Yes, Ms. Casey. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Fieser and the members of the administration for, you know, putting forth an extremely responsible, fiscally responsible budget while clearly ke keeping in mind our principles and our priorities. And I believe that our schools offer many opportunities in various classes and electives for our students to excel and to be challenged. I am also certain that the career pathways and the language labs and the social emotional curriculum especially um, will be a tremendous asset to our schools. And again, we are educating the whole child. Each of these programs creates a unique opportunity for our students. And we owe, obviously, a huge debt of gratitude to our teachers, our dedicated teachers who spend, you know, our days with our kids. And, and, um, and that's the reason why these programs are so successful. Um, and it is time to say yes to this budget and to look forward to the future and all that our schools have to offer and, and to let us work together as a board to make good, thoughtful decisions on behalf of our students and our families in the city. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, we'll, we'll take more of that once we make a motion and, and uh, see if there's any other comments or discussion or uh, amendments or what whatnot on the, the budget itself. So I'll take a motion from um, Mrs. Tobias. All right, I make a motion that the Board of Education approve the superintendent's proposed 2016-17 budget as presented in the amount of $91,786,950 and direct the administration to send it to the mayor. So second. Second. Okay, so we have uh, a motion and a second. Is there further discussion or comments? Ms. Federico. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to also thank Dr. Fieser and the administration for putting forth a very, very responsible budget. This budget supports and builds on the work that has already been done and gives us a glimpse of the future with the college and career pathways. In this budget, we have a $776,000 increase, which includes $741,000 for contractual salary increases. Um, now, I'm not a journalist, but if I were, I would say that's the headline for me right there. Um, in addition, there's $188,000 in benefits increase. Um, again, that's contractual. It's mostly driven by retiree benefits. We can't change that. Um, and there's $181,000 increase in the gas cost. Um, also contractual, also cannot be changed. <coughs> there's an increase in the transportation costs that will help our teenagers come to school to learn in the morning, not exhausted from walking close to an hour each day in each way. And the other highlight for me is that there's about $600,000 in cuts to line items where most people, when they get to a section that's filled with materials and supplies, instructional supplies, most people say, what I have last year, roll that number over. And I applaud you for not doing that, for doing the hard work of going line by line and finding $600,000 in cuts in those areas. And I don't mean to say $600,000 in cuts because we were overspending in the past, because you've explained we spent enough in the past that we don't need as much today. Um, still, I've seen many people in corporate budgets, municipal budgets, roll those numbers over without making any changes to it. And I think that the fact that you have taken the initiative and cut those lines has made our job easier, and I thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Whiskeyman. Um, I, I think it's an excellent budget. Um, I must express my nervousness about the cuts in the technology area, only because I've lived with that a long time and know how rapidly technology changes and how much an investment it takes to just, to, just to keep even with it. So while I'm somewhat 
nervous about cutting that area. I uh, will have to go along with it this time. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to express a, a sense of once, once more, uh, just for the record, stating that I'm a firm believer in languages being taught at the earliest possible age. I would like to see our three-year-olds be bilingual. So just to let you know how I feel about that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Whiskeyman. Any other comments? Are we ready to vote? Yeah. Okay. Um, all in favor of the motion? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Very good. We have that, Ms. Griffin? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, we did a great I, I want to thank the board for what was really a uh, um, somewhat painless process. I mean, <laughs> so, um, you know, certainly we, uh, Dr. Fieser and administration, I think, did a great job on the questions, and everybody asked really great questions. That's important that we do, do that, do our work. Um, so with that, we will, uh, I'll email everybody about the cow meeting, the community of the whole meeting that is uh, scheduled for Monday. I'm um, expecting that we're going to cancel it. Um, so I'll let you know that now, but I'll email everybody. And uh, just make note again of the public hearing for the Board of Finances Wednesday, February 3rd. So um, and if you care to come and listen, um, and hopefully we'll have some parents out there asking them to support our budget. Uh, so with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Oh, you want to do that? I'm a finance